So hi everyone, and welcome to this talk uh, on Soundproof. This is joint work with my colleagues at uh, ETH Zurich. So when it comes to user authentication on the web, we all know that uh, passwords are used uh, literally everywhere, uh, and chances are that uh, this is going to be uh, the passwords are going to stay with us in the foreseeable future, at least. Um, and together with them. Uh, the security weaknesses that uh, passwords have. And we all know, for example, that users uh, reuse passwords, passwords can be leaked from databases, uh, can be guessed, can be fished, and so forth. So many websites acknowledge the problem, and they have started offering uh, two-factor authentication as a, solution, uh, as, a, as a solution to enhance the security of passwords. And the typical example of uh, two-factor authentication is where the user has a token, a smartphone nowadays that displays one-time codes, and then whenever he wants to log in, he needs to supply, besides the username and password, also the currently displayed one-time code. And actually, this form of two-factor authentication is currently the most widely deployed uh, and used. Um, it, it, we call it, we can call it code-based, and uh, the code can, can either be read by an application that is running um, on, on your phone, or it can be received through an SMS message on demand whenever the user uh, attempts to log in. And most, if not all, uh, big companies out there uh, have already some solution, offer a solution like this. Uh, the problem is that the user adoption is pretty small whenever the 2FA is optional, is an optional feature. And there have been a couple of studies that uh, show exactly this. And uh, for example, a very recent one from this year, Eurosec 2015, showed that only 6% out of 100,000 uh, Gmail accounts have 2FA enabled. Now, the reasonable question is why? So why users don't uh, actually bother using 2FA? Um, we cannot know for sure. I mean, there, are my, there may be many reasons for that, but in general, what we believe is that usability is a very important uh, factor. And if you think about it, users are just used to entering user, their, their username and password. And now this method that uh, I just described requires the users to interact mm -hmm. with their phone in order to transfer this one-time code from the phone uh, to the browser from which they log in. And there are already solutions out there uh, that essentially attempt to reduce this level of interaction with the phone. And for example, now the user, there are solutions that, uh, where the user just needs to tap a button on his phone uh, to authorize the login. But still, these kinds of solutions require the user to do extra steps and uh, interact with his phone. So the reasonable next uh, step forward would be to try to completely Come up with, uh, to, to come up with a solution that completely eliminates the user-to-phone interaction so that we can make the 2FA, uh, the 2FA solution as close as, uh, to, to, the, to, the way, to, way, to the way the users are used to authenticate it, which is just entering their password. Um, if you think about it, the second factor is the proof to the server that me as a user that now I try to log in, uh, I have access to my token, to my phone, and with a code-based approach, I prove it by entering this one-time code uh, to the browser. Going one step further, we can say that the, the second factor can, can be just the proximity of the user's phone to the computer from which he's currently logging in. Um, and proximity could be verified, for example, by using some local communication channel between the phone and the computer uh, to transfer this one-time code or execute whatever 2FA pro protocol we need to support uh, without requiring the user to interact with his phone. Alternatively, we could try to sense the environment both from the laptop where the user is logging in and from, the, from his device and determine that the two devices are co-located, are in the same environment. So let's see what options do we have. Um, for example, for, uh, for uh, phone co to computer communication, we could use Bluetooth. And uh, there has been uh, a work from uh, back 2012 that 
did exactly this. And what they propose is using unpaired Bluetooth communication between the computer and the phone in order to execute the 2FA protocol. Notice the word unpaired. Uh, the authors of the, of the paper believed, and we agree, that having the user to pair his, uh, his phone with a computer prior, whenever he wants to log in from a, from a new device can be a usability issue. So that's why the, the authors chose to go from a, for, for an unpaired solution. Now, the problem with this approach is that currently browsers, JavaScript running with this browser, within a browser, doesn't have a, a way to talk over Bluetooth to reach the phone, to communicate with the phone. This means that for this solution to work nowadays, we need to either modify the browser or install some additional software or plugin, for example, in order to make it happen. So we see that there is a deployability issue, which is important because if, if people uh, need to do extra steps in order to make this happen, to, to, for example, uh, for, for this solution to work, they need to install a plugin, this is probably going to hurt uh, usability as well and, and adoption. So for them, being, we discard this solution. We, similarly, we could use Wi-Fi. There has been a paper uh, last year that proposes using, uh, creating a virtual access point on the laptop and pairing the laptop and the phone over this uh, virtual uh, Wi-Fi network. The problem, again, is that the user needs to install uh, extra software for this to happen. Plus, he needs to go through this setup procedure every time he wants to log in from a new device. So we also currently discard this solution. OK, what about the other way of uh, detecting proximity? For example, assessing the environment. A very uh, straightforward solution that could come uh, in our head would be to use a, a location-based approach. So we could use GPS to verify that the computer we are logging in and our phone is at the same location. Now, besides some security issues that this solution has, but I will not go into details, the problem is that currently, although phones, all of them have GPS, uh, access to GPS, this is not the case for uh, typical commodity computers, uh, laptops and desktops. So we also discard the solution. Now, if you think about it, there is a sensor that might come in handy from what we want to do, and this is the microphone. Microphones are, ubiquitous, are arguably ubiquitous, both, both on uh, smartphones and on uh, uh, computers. And what is important here is that JavaScript running in your browser can directly capture audio from the microphone using the WebRTC API that uh, some of the major browsers already support. So this brings us to soundproof. Uh, with Soundproof, we leverage the microphone on, uh, on our devices in order to sense ambient audio to detect the pro to verify the proximity and use this as, as our second authentication factor. Our solution is usable as it doesn't require any user-to-phone interaction and is deployable because it's compatible with uh, today's uh, smartphones and browsers without requiring any plugins or additional software. We implemented the prototype on Android and iOS and we used it in order to evaluate whether our solution actually works in a variety of environments um, and also wh wh whether it works, for example, when uh, the, the user's phone is in his pocket or maybe in a purse somewhere near in the room. Um, and I will come to the results soon. So just to give you a high-level overview of how the scheme works, the user enters username and password as usual, and if this first step is successful, then the server will instruct both the computer and the phone to start recording. They will record for a certain amount of time, for example, three seconds, and then both of them will come up with a recorded sample. Now, what happened next is that the computer sample will be transferred to the phone through the server. So there is no, there is no local computer to phone uh, communication, and all the communication happens uh, through the server. Now, the phone will take the two samples, and, will co and his, its task is to compare them and uh, compute a similarity score S. Now, depending on whether this score S is above or below a certain predefined threshold, the phone can inform the server 
on whether this login is deemed as legitimate uh, or not. So the, 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 attacker, the, the type of attacker that Soundproof tries to, to protect against is a remote attacker that has somehow already obtained uh, the user's credentials, username and password, and he wants to log in as the user on the, on the particular server. So he submits the victim's username and password, which, which are correct, and then the Soundproof protocol uh, initiates. And the both, now the attacker's device and the user's phone start recording. And the attacker's goal is to submit an audio sample that will match the sample recorded by the user's phone. In other words, the attacker has to guess the type of sound that is currently, can be, that can be currently heard uh, at the victim's environment at the time of the attack. And in a bit, I'll show you that uh, according to our empirical uh, results, this is actually a hard thing for the attacker to do. Notice, however, that the silence, or in other words, the absence of noise, is something that the attacker can easily guess. For example, if, when the user sleeps and has his phone uh, next to him, uh, there might be a lot of silence in, uh, in, the, in the room. So the, the attacker could just uh, submit a similarly silent sample and try to, to fool the system. So that's why our system requires that both submitted samples the, from the computer and the phone are above a certain silence threshold. Okay, um, now soundproof, so the, tot the total time that soundproof requires uh, for, for, for the soundproof protocol to execute, uh, assuming that we count from the time that the user clicks login uh, till the time that the browser eventually refreshes the content and logs the user in. Uh, and this includes the recording time which we set to three seconds for our uh, experiments. So the total time regardless of where the phone was connected to Wi-Fi or cellular network, it was on average below five seconds, although as expected with cellular connectivity, it was a bit higher. Uh, I need to, to say here that there is quite a few room for, uh, for, for improvement because uh, our prototype implementation, what it did was to, for example, the computer was, recorded, was recording for the full time of three seconds and then was uploading uh, the whole raw sample to the, to the phone through the server. But of course, uh, we could save on this network time by compressing or streaming the recording and uh, not waiting until the recording on the browser has, has, completely, uh, has been completed. Uh, so in order to evaluate our system and see if it actually works in practice, uh, we ran uh, an extensive audio collection campaign. Uh, two users were performing login attempts using our uh, soundproof uh, prototype over the course of one month. And we tried a variety of environments, for example, a, a typical office environment, an office environment where music can be heard, a home where the TV is on, a lecture room, a train station or a cafeteria. We tried different operating systems, for, so Mac and uh, Windows. We tried different phones, uh, iOS and Android. We tried different positions for, for the phone, so just being outside at the table where the user is, or in his pocket or in a purse nearby him. And also different user activities, so you, the user could be completely silent or could be talking, coughing, or whistling when the, the authentication is, uh, is taking place. In total, we, recording, we recorded um, and collected approximately 4,000 uh, samples, or in other words, 2,000 uh, login attempts. And we used this, um, uh, this data set to tune our sound comparison uh, algorithm. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into details because anyway, I didn't talk about how exactly the, the comparison works, but to give you a, an example, we found out that uh, our algorithm works better when we only look the frequencies between 50 hertz and 4 kilohertz, and we discard the, rec the rest of the frequency sp spectrum. Uh, after we tuned and uh, we tuned our um, the parameters, then we tried to compute the false rejection and, and false acceptance rate uh, for different 
values of the similarity score threshold. And you can see, so a false rejection is when a legitimate login is rejected. And as you can see, as the threshold, the similarity score threshold increases, the chances are higher, as expected, for a, for a legitimate login to be rejected. For the false acceptance rate, which is when a fraudulent login is uh, accepted, we tried the following strategy. So we had two users collecting our samples. So uh, in order to compute the false acceptance rate, we took the samples of one user and tried to attack all the samples of, of the other user and vice versa. And this yielded about uh, a, a few millions of, of attack pairs. Uh, and with this, we computed uh, the false acceptance rate. And as you can see, of course, as expected, as the, th as the similarity score threshold increases, it gets harder for the attacker to, to get a fraudulent login uh, accepted. And if we go for the sweet spot where we balance security and usability, mm -hmm. uh, the equal error rate was computed, uh, was found to be at when the th similarity score, score threshold was at 0 0.13, and mm -hmm. the equal error rate was 0.2. Uh, percent. Uh, here we can see all our collected samples categorized over uh, the different environments that we, um, that we tried. And we have similar plots in the paper uh, showing the behavior of our system um, for, for the other variables that we use, for example, uh, the phone position, the kind of laptop we used, uh, and so on. We can see here that this gray line is the threshold that we set the 0.13, and we have four samples below it, which means that we had, false, we had four false rejections out of the 2,000, um, and this is a, essentially the 0.2% uh, result that I showed you uh, before. All right, so we talked about uh, remote attackers and that uh, it turns out that it's hard for them to uh, guess the, the environment uh, sound and uh, cheat uh, soundproof. What about co-located attackers? So again, we have an attacker that knows the victim's credentials, but now he's co-located with a victim. And he submits the username and password as usual, soundproof, kicks in, starts recording, and now the chances are that the sample submitted by the attacker will be similar to the one recorded by the user's phone. Um, and in this case, the attack will succeed. Notice that here the, attack, the attacker doesn't have to guess anything because he's just sitting next, uh, close to the, uh, to the victim and the, his device can record uh, the, the same sound that the, the user's phone will record. So collocated attackers are not, uh, cannot be thwarted by our solution. Uh, now, we argue that co-located attacks in general are hard to defeat. Um, a co-located attacker is usually a targeted attacker, so he wants to attack a particular uh, person, typically. And uh, if you think about it, if there is no user-to-phone interaction, then the attack is trivial. Because if the 2FA mechanism doesn't require the user to interact with his phone, then also the attacker can try to uh, use this 2FA mechanism if he knows the user's credential without requiring any interaction with the phone. This has an exception if we require that before using the 2FA approach, we require that the user's phone uh, has to be securely paired, for example, over Bluetooth um, with, with uh, his computer, such that the attacker cannot use his device in order to talk with the phone and perform the 2FA protocol. The problem with this approach is that this requires this pairing procedure every time the user has to uh, log in from a new device, which kind of hurts uh, usability. Uh, now, of course, if, if the 2FA approach requires user-to-phone interaction, for example, the traditional code-based approach, then it, it surely gets harder for the attacker because now the attacker needs to access the phone and retrieve, retrieve the code. But we argue that a determined sufficiently skilled attacker that can be co-located with a victim will eventually find the opportunity to access uh, the user's phone. So there is a clear trade-off here between security and usability. You can 
try to make the 2FA scheme more secure and harder for a co-located attacker to succeed, but at the same time, you are hurting uh, the usability aspect. Um, so we also did uh, a very preliminary study to get a taste of whether, uh, of how the users uh, perceive the usability of soundproof. So we recruited 32 participants, no security experts, and in a controlled environment, we asked them to evaluate and compare the usability of the most popular currently deployed 2FA mechanism, which is the Google two-step verification, the code-based approach, with soundproof. Um, the results were that the users, the participants, rated the usability of, uh, of soundproof uh, more highly than, than of uh, Google two-step verification. And according to the feedback that we received, this, is, this was mainly due to the fact that, the, that soundproof, soundproof was much faster to, to use and also didn't require any user interaction. Uh, apart from that, we asked the users whether they would be willing to use any of the two approaches in real life. And users were, more, were significantly more, uh, more likely to say that they would use soundproof rather than uh, Google Dosv, even if the 2FA mechanism was, an, was optional. So to sum up, soundproof is an attempt or a hope from our part, if you like, to foster ad adoption of 2FA on the web. So if we, if we consider these three pillars here of a user authentication mechanism on the web, we have security, usability and deployability, and user adoption. And the current state with password-only authentication is that, sure, we have, we, we, we have uh, low security, but the usability and deployability are good. I mean, users are used to using passwords, mm -hmm. and there are no deploy, deployability uh, problems. So the user adoption is high and everyone is using them. Now, existing 2FA approaches do a very good job at increasing significantly the security of the, of, of the user authentication on the web, but they do so at the cost of either usability or deployability or both. And this, we believe, leads uh, to small user adoption. In other words, we believe that usability and deployability is very highly correlated with the user adoption. So what we try to do with Soundproof is to balance things out a little bit and offer a solution that is more secure than password, admittedly less secure than some of the existing 2FA approaches. And actually in the paper, we do comparisons uh, with uh, the various existing approaches um, in terms of security. But with a more balanced and better usability and deployability aspect in order to foster adoption of the 2FA mechanism and then be, being able to take advantage of the, of the increased security that it can offer. Feel free to access our website, um, where you can also see a video, a demo video of Soundproof in action. And with this, I'm happy to take your questions. Hi, Bill Cheswick, University of Pennsylvania. I really love this approach. It adds an audio component to shoulder surfing. Uh, I, I wonder if you thought about a couple of items that might, yes. be, might add to it. One is to have the computer itself generate some sound so the user may know this is going on. Obviously, someone in the same room could see it. And if you think of this a little further, there was a demonstration at uh, a USENIC's annual technical conference about five years ago of someone who proved that about half the computers in the world can generate and listen to ultrasound up to about 25 kilohertz. So you might be able to communicate without even bothering anybody but a nearby dog. Yes, uh, so, <laughs> exactly. So first of all, if the sound is in the, in the audible spectrum, then you might have the problem that you know, the user might be, feel a bit awkward when the computer is generating some sound. Now, for sure, there is this ultrasound approach. Actually, there are uh, some solutions. For example, there is a, a company that was recently acquired by Google called Slick Login that they try to use ultrasound as a communication channel between uh, the computer and the, and the, and the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
actually, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure of, of how well this works because it's not uh, out there yet. Uh, but we could think of some problems besides the dog <laughs> issue. Yeah. Yeah. For example, uh, uh, this requires that the user needs to to pay attention to have the, the speaker's volume at a sufficient level when authenticated. And for example, maybe he, he, at that point he's listening to music with his headphones, so, so he needs to unplug the, uh, the headphone and then, you know, turn on the speaker, authenticate, you know. So it might have some uh, problems uh, regarding to usability. But yes, this is a, an approach that can be used. Okay, yes. thank you. Hello, Tamara Denning, University of Utah. So I had a question about your choice for these kind of a gold standard for the usability comparison. You went with current solutions that are either SMS or uh, app-based as opposed to uh, some of the emerging standards that are looking at also trying to hit a sweet spot between usability and security. So for example, you didn't do any of the uh, UTF approaches and I was kind of curious as to your choice of using the, uh, the app instead. We used the app because it's the most currently used uh, appro approach. Um, I mean, compared to SMS, I believe it's more or less the same. Now, approaches like uh, phone oath and uh, solutions that require uh, no user to phone interaction, we didn't use because anyway, the usability would be more or less the same uh, mm -hmm. with our solution. Uh, but these solutions are not currently deployable. They might be in the future. Uh, so we just tested what is out there compared to our solution and see if the users, you know, like it or, you know, just to get okay. the feeling. Uh, I agree that the SMS and app approaches are more currently more broadly used, but you can and have for some time been able to just buy UTF tokens that are, that are one touch online. What is this token again? Can, can you? Uh, UTF, Universal Second Factor. It's part of the, it's from the FIDO ah. Alliance. Ah, the token that you need to plug in uh, the USB. Uh, one, some right? of them actually don't need to plug on. They can just do NFC, but they do usually require a, a touch, I presume by choice, so that you can't So essentially, the, this, 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 uh, this, um, this UTF uh, token was the, the development of Phone Oath, the paper that I... Uh, talked about at some point. And yes, I mean, if you have a, a separate token for this, then, then you have another issue of, you know, the user might uh, need to carry an extra token uh, to, to, to perform the authentication. So, so th then we might have other usability uh, aspects. We didn't explore uh, this. Uh, now, if you have NFC, for example, from your, for, from your phone, yes. Uh, the problem now is still that the user would be required to take his phone out and do the authentication, right? So, so there is still user-to-phone interaction. Uh, and pl plus the fact that the NFC is not uh, as ubiquitous as uh, microphones. Uh, but yes, we didn't try that. Uh, okay, all right, thank you. Hi, so, so it seems your threat model sort of assumes that either the attacker is in the same room and has access to the sound environment or has no access to the sound environment. Uh, during the Super Bowl or the State of the Union, there is broadcast sound that's being sent and that a large number of people are receiving the same sound yes. environment. Uh, so, how, yes. does, how does the threat model factor that in? So we consider these attacks and uh, we have a section in the paper about that. So we thought, okay, maybe the attacker can guess that the user now is listening to this radio station or to this, is watching to this TV channel, right? Uh, and we performed some experiments on that. Uh, on a high level, what we found out is that, first of all, let, let me tell you something that I didn't talk about. Our solution, when comparing the samples, requires them to be synchronized. So we have a synchronization uh, pr protocol that is going on when the 2FA uh, protocol is executed. And let's assume that the attacker submits exactly the same sample as, as what the, the phone recorded, but after 200 milliseconds. So, so there is a, a shift of, of a few milliseconds. This will not go through in our solution. So what we tried with this um, broadcast example, we tried to record, to, to perform this attack, uh, and we found out that, that when uh, the channel, the correctly guessed channel by the attacker, uh, was received through the same provider and within the same city, then the time synchronization was very, very small, so, so the, the attack could succeed. Uh, but if the attacker, for example, was located in, an, in another city or country, or uh, was receiving the same signals through a different provider, then the synchronization of the two signals was sufficient enough for the attack not to work. So, the, so this means that the attacker had to guess 
you know, what the offset of the synchronization was in order to submit uh, the signal in such, a, in such a way that the synchronization will, will match. I don't know if, the, if this is clear or not, but we can uh, talk about this off, offline. But yes, there is a section in the paper that uh, describes exactly this attack. Hi, my name is Guus Bassman with E-Trade. Have you, it was a great paper. Have you looked at uh, increasing the duration, so more than three seconds, and, and how much does that improve security? Because in our use case, we often do these things as an escalation when we're suspicious about interaction anyway. So we don't mind six, seven, eight seconds. Uh, we did some small experiments, not large scale. Uh, the, the more the, the, the more the recording duration was, the harder it was for the attack to succeed. Uh, and then when we went below two seconds approximately, then it was quite easy for the attack to succeed. Uh, we could, you could envision a solution where you know, the, the recording time is not fixed. There is a minimum one, like three seconds or something, and then, uh, you know, depending on the on the on the accurate on, on the confidence of the system, you might require some more uh, some more time to to record in order to to gain. Yes. Thank you. All right. Let's thank Nikos.